started. My name is Kimberly, and I'm one of the librarians here at Seattle Central College. And I want to welcome you to our weekly series entitled Conversations on Social Issues. We host this session every week because we see it as an extension of our mission to promote the freedom of ideas and open exchange of information. <coughs> so the same way that you may not agree with every single thing that you find on our shelves or in our databases, um, we are, you may not agree with every single thing that you hear today or in any of our sessions, but I'm going to ask that everyone remain respectful, have good, um, vigorous, and polite conversation, and so that everyone gets the benefit of everyone's view. So, we have students, faculty, staff members, and community members come and present at these series. And so if you are interested, if you feel passionately about a topic and would like to come up here for 50 minutes to an hour and talk about something to your peers and fellow Seattle Central College folks, um, come talk to me or Kelly Beth Henry. She's in that office, but I'll be the face for today. <coughs> so before we get started, I'm going to pull up some of the resources that we have here at the library. I've put up a number of books um, that touch on the topic we're gonna to be discussing today. If you'd like additional resources, if you head out to the reference desk, which is the big desk in the middle of the library, we'll be happy to get you some more information. So at the end of this, I'm going to ask that everyone fill out a quick survey. It's all checking boxes and filling bubbles, um, so we can learn more about what you'd like to see here and how we can continue to improve on this series. So next week, if you're interested, our conversation <coughs> will be on Lost in the Fine Print, when signing up for a cell phone threatens your basic rights with Patty Borman, who will be facilitating this discussion on the issue of forced arbitration. But today we're going to have a special two-hour event, so please stay as long as you can um, for one or both sessions. And the first hour we'll be exploring the topic of political prisoners in the United States, and specifically the case of the Cuban Five, um, facilitated by John Martinez. And the second hour will be led by Abby <coughs> Jewell and Marjorie Richards, and the title of that session is Cuba Libre, Gender and Sexuality in Cuba. So please stay as long as you can, and let's welcome Tom. Thank you, Kimberly, and thank you, the staff of the library, for inviting me to present on this issue, on this topic today. So I hope everyone has a card. This is a, an exhibition of artwork by a man named Antonio Guerrero. And Antonio Guerrero, I'll explain soon, is one of the Cuban five. And he and the five are, were <coughs> in American prisons. They were convicted of conspiracy to commit espionage against the United States government. And they, they were in prison for about 16 years. Now they are free. Now they are home in Cuba. And I'll explain what happened there. But when I asked the library to present this topic uh, three months ago, they were still in prison. They were not free yet. So I was thinking that I would talk about them only, but because they are free, I think it's better to expand the topic and talk a little bit about Cuba, the history of Cuba, the Cuban Revolution, and where the Cuban Five uh, are part of that story. So let me go ahead. I have some slides here. I'm going to go a little fast because there's a lot of history to cover, but in the discussion, if you have a question, we can go back to a slide, look at it, and talk about it some more. Uh, as you can see, I am part of the teachers' union here at the community college. And three years ago, our union helped to organize an exhibition of art by Mr. Antonio Guerrero downstairs in the art gallery here at the college. So that was three years ago. And that was a an effort by our union to help win justice for Antonio Guerrero and uh, the Cuban Five. But now the story has changed, so let's talk a little bit more about this history. So you can see, can you see the, the, the country called Cuba? It's a long island, and it's right there between Florida and Mexico, and it has Jamaica, the uh, Dominican Republic, Haiti to the south, and uh, you can hand Cancun. Look at Cancun in Mexico, so close to Cuba. But then again, Cuba is also very close to Florida. So for over a hundred years, the United States government, and especially the the big people, the big people who own big farms and land in Florida and Louisiana, they did a lot of business with Cuba. And for many years, 
especially in the 1880s and the 1890s, people wanted to take control of Cuba because it was such a uh, productive uh, land for farming and industry. So you can see, because of geography, Cuba is a very big part of American history. The modern history of Cuba really begins around 1868, uh, and there are several wars of independence. So Cuba is a colony of Spain. But at this time, Spain is getting weaker. It's becoming weaker. And the people of Cuba want more independence, more freedom to uh, lead their lives and control their country. And as they fight the wars, as they fight Spain, they learn that they must have more unity. So the armies that are fighting for independence of Cuba are organizing different people together. Most, some of them are white, Spanish, some of them are mixed mestizos, others are Afro-Cubans, who are mostly slaves, and even Chinese, Chinese Cubans who, are, who went to Cuba to work. Uh, these people are beginning to get organized into these different wars to win independence from Spain. Spain, like I said, is not very strong. Spain cannot defeat them. But as these people fight for their independence, the people of the United States look at this and they say, the people of Cuba should be free. So there were thousands and thousands of people in the United States that supported the Cubans in their war of independence. By 1898, the Spanish government could no longer uh, win, this, win this war. They were, they were treating the Cuban people very badly, killing and torturing many Cuban people. And in the United States, you can see on the left side, the famous newspaper, The Examiner, uh, was kept reporting about what the Spanish were doing to the Cuban people. And the American people were very sympathetic. They really supported the Cuban effort to be independent. But the image on the right side here, we see Uncle Sam with a big sombrero. There are also people who are saying, be careful. Because Uncle Sam has in his basket already a fruit that's called California and Louisiana. And uh, what's the other one? Florida. These are territories that Uncle Sam, the US government, took by conquest took by military action. And now he's looking up at that tree, and he's looking at that big fruit that's called Cuba. So you see, even then, people said, we support Cuban independence, but be careful that Uncle Sam, the American government, and, and capitalists don't take it over. Well, the Cuban, finally Spain did was uh, defeated, Spain decided to get out of Cuba and they signed a peace treaty with the United States uh, to get out. And, uh, but the United States had an army in Cuba already that helped defeat the Spanish and the United States kept its army in Cuba. They would not take it out. And when the Cuban people were organizing their new constitution to create their new, their new country, they wanted a constitution to control their system. But the people in the, in the United States government decided that that constitution needed some more uh, permission for the United States government to come in and tell them what to do. So a United States senator named Platt wrote a law in the United States that told the Cuban people, your new constitution must have language that lets the United States come back in anytime we want. And that we have a control over what you do with your economy and with your land. So even though the Cuban people were trying to establish a new government, the United States government was already controlling them in, at least on, in their new laws. But you see on the left side, uh, some people were critical of the Platt Amendment in the Cuban Constitution. They show the man burning the back of the Cuban fighter with Uncle Sam looking. So that's negative. This one on the right side, you know, this, this was a positive image that people in the United States also saw. This was from a magazine called Puck, 
P-U-C-K, very popular in the United States around this time, 1900. You see Uncle Sam, he's, con he's the, the schoolmaster, he's the teacher, and sitting in front of him, of him are these bad little children. And it's difficult to see, but one little child is Cuba, the other one is Puerto Rico, the other one is Hawaii, and I think the other one is Philippines. So because of the Spanish-American War, the United States took control of these countries. And, but the image in the United States in places like New York, Chicago, Milwaukee, uh, Los Angeles, the people, the image that the, the newspapers and magazines published was this image of Uncle Sam, the big white teacher, teaching civilization to the naughty little children of the islands. And of course, in the back, you see the good white children learning uh, their lesson, the bad children in the front. So this, these are the kinds of ideas that uh, were, were in the United States. Uh, this is a little difficult to see, but this, this is some of the language of the Platt Amendment, which was part of the Cuban Constitution from 1903 to 1933. And it basically said Cuba could not make any treaty with another nation without the permission of the United States. No foreign power can claim territory in Cuba without okay from the United States. All of this had U.S. Uh, conditions. Cuba had to let the U.S. lease naval stations in Cuba, and then finally, the United States had the right to intervene in Cuba any time they thought something negative could happen. This was actually a part of their constitution, and they got rid of it in 1933. But one of the consequences of this Platt Amendment was, you can see on the bottom, U.S. Naval Base at Guant Guantanamo Bay. So, and in fact, the United States government still has a naval base there. It's big. It's very big. It's also Camp X-Ray, where they keep uh, prisoners from the so-called War on Terror. Uh, you know, the Cuban government, from 1959 on, has asked the United States to leave. Every year, the United States government gives the Cuban government a check for about $100,000 for rent. Cuban government just puts it in a box and says, we want you to leave. But the United States government still keeps that naval base there. Uh, any naval base always is a method of controlling the local population. But with the, with the Platt Amendment, the Constitution, you can see that U.S. economic interests grow in Cuba. Cuba's supposed to be free, but the United States interests now are pouring into Cuba, taking control of sugar, railroad, nickel, telecommunications, and building their big casinos. And you can see in this little chart here how American, the percent of Cuban sugar controlled by the United States just kept increasing. It just kept increasing. This goes for their ore, their mining, their nickel production, their fishing, their, 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 lump, their lumber and their wood. All of these natural resources and the work of the Cuban people is being controlled now by United States interests. So keep this in mind because President Obama talks about U.S. interests in Cuba. That's what he likes to talk about. But remember, this is the history behind those words. And people forget that, and it's important to remember. At the same time, the United States government and the Marines were busy around the Caribbean. Remember the map at the beginning of our presentation? But the Marines were busy intervening, getting into other people's business, Mexico during its revolution, Nicaragua trying to overthrow a dictatorship led by the rebels, were led by a man named uh, Sandino. He fought the U.S. Marines several times in Haiti. The, you see the U.S. Marines were there. In fact, Haiti, the country of Haiti, is getting ready to celebrate the 100th anniversary you can see right there, 1915. So in 2015, they're going to have programs to remember the 100th anniversary of how U.S. Marines invaded and occupied Haiti. Panama, when the Panama was split from Colombia, the U.S. Marines were there also. U.S. Marines and advisors were also busy in Guatemala, Colombia, Venezuela, and, and Puerto Rico, the island of Vieques was militarized. So the entire Caribbean area 
was a big military uh, space for the United States. But in 1959, finally the Cuban people, they've tried to rebel and change. Finally, a new generation in 1959, they, uh, they said, this has to stop. This has to stop. The control of our country, the, the, the stealing of our resources, the, the unemployment that our farmers face, the, the situation of our women who can't find work with dignity. So you could see the, the, the rebels around Fidel Castro and others uh, are leading a revolutionary struggle in Cuba and even in the streets of the city of Havana. Here's a photo of uh, Chinese in, the, in uh, Havana Chinatown who are coming out to support the rebels, coming out to support Fidel Castro. They are going to make war and revolution against them the dictator of Cuba at this time, a man named Batista. And Batista, since 1933, was uh, organizing the Cuban government <coughs> at, uh, to help the United States' interests. But whenever the Cuban people were making moves to defend their freedom and their sovereignty, there was always some kind of aggression or some kind of attack from outside especially from the rich Cubans who were losing their lands and no, no longer had control like in the past. And of course, the big banks and, and owners from the United States who wanted to get control back the way they used to have it. They used to have it under Batista. And you can see here Fidel Castro, he's talking to uh, the people. Anytime somebody talks about democracy in Cuba, maybe you can show them this picture. Because there's really no place else in the world where your president will stand before the people and that people all have guns. This, this, is, this is a form of democracy that people don't understand, but it, it's necessary to make a revolution and defend it. But as they made the revolution, the United States government started to uh, pass laws to restrict trade with Cuba. Remember, Cuba's trade was mostly with the United States. So all of a sudden, Uncle Sam said, nope, no more. We're going to cut your sugar quota. We're going to cut your nickel quota. That is the amount of those products they can sell uh, to, in the United States. When Cuba wanted to expand trade and sell sugar to the Soviet Union, uh, then uh, the United States government cut their quota even more. Finally, the United States government would not allow the American refineries, the oil refineries, to uh, handle crude oil from, 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 uh, from Russia. So over time, using the Navy, the United States government kept punishing the Cuban people and their economy for making a revolution. And over here, you see a little boat that says the United Nations lift the embargo, stop the embargo. Over the last 23 years, the United Nations Assembly has voted almost 95% to end this embargo. Last 23 years, in a row, the United Nations Assembly keeps voting, but still the United States ignores what the world says. In 1961, there was an invasion of Cuba at a place called Bay of Pigs. This was an invasion organized and paid for by the CIA. But it was done mostly by the former Cuban landowners, uh, businessmen, and soldiers who wanted to return to Cuba, start a counter-revolution, and come back to power. But that Bay of Pigs invasion only lasted 72 hours. It was defeated and stopped by the regular Cuban army, their military, their militias, and their police. So that plan in 1961 to bring back the old government uh, lost and the people of Cuba were able to continue to defend their, uh, their country. Let me just go a little bit over this. It's a lot of information. Uh, so the economic financial embargo against Cuba that doesn't allow them to use American banks or American uh, systems over the 50 years have, have cost the Cuban people $1 trillion. And if the average 
Cuban GDP is $60 billion, $60 billion, that's probably 100 years worth of economic activity that is lost to the Cuban people because of this policy of the U.S. government. That's why that, that embargo is so, da is so dangerous and, and, uh, in and damaging. Counter-revolutionary violence also came from the United States and <coughs> other places. And over time, the counter-revolution, people trying to come back to power in Cuba or trying to uh, injure the damage the Cuban economy, they killed over 3,500 Cuban civilians, injured over 2,100. And flying planes and dropping bombs uh, over Cuba, a lot of these, a lot of homes, factory schools, farm, farm fields were damaged. A lot of economic damage done by what we call counter-revolutionaries. Okay? But even with American aggression, even with counter-revolutionaries, the people still of Cuba still wanted to uh, develop their country and protect their freedom. So they in 1961, they decided, yes, we're going to make socialism in our country. You can see on the left side, United Fruit Company is nationalized. United Fruit, of course, is a huge American company with big lands in Mexico, Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala. And in Guatemala, they had just, they overthrew a president because the president tried to take some of their land. But in Cuba, the people organized themselves to go back to the United Fruit Company and nationalize it, make it the property of the state and the people. On this right side, in 1961, tens of thousands of young people, your age, 14, 15, 16, 17, and uh, were organized to teach Cubans in the countryside how to read and write. That's the famous literacy crusade. So in a one year, they were able to eliminate what's called illiteracy. About 40% of the Cuban people could not read and write in 1959, but not by 1961, all of that was corrected. Everyone was taught to read up to the third grade level in 1961. That was a big campaign by young people. Also, because of the United States' economic aggression, the Cuban people and their government nationalized companies. For example, on the left side is General Electric. The company was nationalized and the electric rates were cut in half. Over here on the right side, you see all these medical workers. They're all volunteers ready to come to Louisiana to help the people of New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. Cuba has, uh, has over 100,000 doctors and medical workers. Now they also have the famous school, uh, Latin, the medical school of Latin America, where they invite young people from around the world to come study medicine in Cuba for free. And about every year, 15, about 15 students come from the United States and they get, uh, I believe it's six years of education to be a medical doctor in Cuba and you're also prepared to take the boards in the United States. So here's a country that's poor, that's losing money because of the, of the embargo and the attacks, but still they're, they're going to invite young people to come, learn medicine, go back, serve their people. Cuba supported the people of Angola against the invasions from South Africa. But in 1991, the, the, uh, the USSR, right, Russia, and the Eastern Bloc countries uh, uh, fell. Cuba loses a lot of its trade with them. So 1991 is a very difficult year. 1992, people start leaving Cuba on rafts, going to Florida. 1994, an organization out of Florida is, is flying planes looking for these rafters. Uh, again, many Cubans were killed uh, by terrorist activity. Uh, 1994, these uh, brothers to the rescue, they were helping some Cubans, but as the Cubans, as the rafters ended, they started, brothers to the rescue started to violate Cuban airspace and again create provocations trying to create problems between the United States and Cuba. So in Cuba, they ask for volunteers. Who wants to go or who can go to the United States, talk, uh, talk and live with these counter-revolutionaries and report back to Cuba 
on what they're doing. So they wanted volunteers to go to, to Florida to monitor, monitor these counter-revolutionary groups that were making trouble for Cuba. So I want to introduce the Cuban Five. They came, they have different experiences. Some of them fought in Angola to defeat the South African army. Uh, others, like uh, Antonio, was an architect, uh, engineer, helped build an important airport. They volunteered, and that was very difficult because they had to convince their family and neighbors that they were really leaving Cuba, they were unhappy, and that they were going to the United States to join the other side. But they were on a mission because they had to tell their country what was coming at them from the counter-revolutionaries. And you see, in 95, 97, there were bombings in Cuba, organized by the counter-revolutionaries. 1996, brothers to the rescue. They violate Cuban airspace 26 times. In February of that year, the Cuban Air Force, Air Force shoots down two of those aircraft that were flying over Cuba. And then later, 1997, the FBI gets information that, and they start investigating the Cuban Five. And this is 1997, they begin to break into their homes because the five are living in Florida, working as uh, their workers at the different places and collecting information on the counter-revolutionaries. But the FBI begins to investigate them and break into their house and steal information from their computers. And 1998, the FBI wants to arrest 14 people. Uh, 10 are arrested on September 12th. Of those 10 arrested, five pled guilty, and they, went, they were, we didn't hear from them again. Four of those original 14 were never found. But the Cuban five decided they will go to trial and defend their, their innocence, defend their mission and their innocence. And the five are held in the Miami Detention Center in 1998 in solitary confinement for six months. So at this point, this is where this story begins. Okay, this is where this story is, uh, begins. Mr. Antonio Guerrero, the painter, is painting here, and you'll see at the gallery images that he painted from that experience of being in the Miami Detention Center in solitary confi confinement. For six months, in the 2000, their trial begins. They are charged with conspiracy to commit espionage. But no evidence is ever produced by the FBI and the prosecutors. They never found a piece of paper that said, this is harmful information. And one of the members, Gerardo Hernandez, is charged with conspiracy, conspiracy to commit murder for Brothers to the Rescue airplanes that were shot down in 96. And the Miami press, the newspaper reporters, and the TV reporters in Miami were getting government money from the United States to generate false information accusing the five of terrorism, of planning to invade uh, Florida with virus and other kinds of poisons. All of this was paid for by the United States government during the time of the trial. At this time, too, a little boy named Elian Gonzalez was rescued from the ocean, and there was a big fight between his parents, one side and one, some fam excuse me, one family in Florida, one family in Cuba, but that created uh, big publicity, big newspaper articles, and it made the situation very hostile in, in Miami. So in June 2001, the five are convicted on all the counts. The, con the charge of conspiracy meant that they did not produce, they did not produce any evidence of stealing government information. They were, they were, convicted of thinking about it, okay? Just like you can be convicted of thinking about stealing an apple, they were convicted of, of, of conspiracy to commit espionage, which they denied and was never proven in any document. In December 2001, they were sentenced, they were given the maximum sentences. So here, Gerardo Hernandez, because they accused them of conspiracy to commit murder, he gets two life sentences plus 15 years telling him, you are going to die in prison. That's what the, that's what the judge said. Ramon Lavanino, life sentence, plus 18. Antonio Guerrero, also life sentence, plus 10.
Fernando Gonzalez, 19 years. Rene Gonzalez, 15 years. But you know, four years later, they appealed to a, a, a three-judge panel in Atlanta, because you can appeal your conviction. And that, those three judges looked at the record of the trial in Miami and the stories about the journalists being paid to create a, a hostile environment. And even some of the jurors from Miami trial wrote to these judges and said, we were afraid. We were afraid to, to declare the five innocent because there was so much counter-revolutionary activity in the streets of Miami. We felt threatened. If we, if we said innocent, they would hurt us. So we had to rule guilty. So the three judges said, reverse the verdict and order a new trial. But the, but the prosecution didn't like that. They took that decision from the judges to a full, full panel of 11 judges. And those 11 judges did a lot of arm twisting in order to reverse what happened in Atlanta. So the rulings and the convictions were reinstated. In 2008, some of the sentences, those life sentences, were reduced, except for Gerardo Hernandez, because the panel says those sentences were excessive. 2009, the United States Supreme Court refuses to hear the appeals. 2009, maybe you've heard that there was a contractor hired by the United States government, uh, uh, Agency for International Development, AID, named Alan Gross. He started going to Cuba, but he was arrested because he had been bringing in electronic devices for organizations in Cuba. Uh, in 2011, he was convicted in Cuba based upon the evidence that he, uh, they had collected and the things that he brought in, and he was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Finally, in December 17, 2014, just a month ago, uh, President Obama and President Castro of Cuba announced on the same day that they were going to reestablish uh, diplomatic relations after 56 years and that they were going to exchange these prisoners. So they're also the five are now home and in Cuba and Alan Gross and a few others from Havana are in the United States. So that was an exchange of prisoners. When they went to trial, that's when the campaign to free them really took off. And that's the campaign to win them justice is what this art show is about. So around the world, in 2001, when people heard about how they were treated in United States courts, people around the world began to protest at United States embassies. The one on the left is in Quebec, the one on the right is in Greece, in Athens. The one on the left is in Southwest Africa, uh, Namibia. The one on the right is Russian. So around the world, people were joining together, finding a way to win justice because they had been treated so badly. Even in the United States, in Washington, D.C., here's a poster in Houston. You can see that people were coming together and finding ways to talk about their case. On the left side, that's a banner in California over the freeway. And here in Seattle, in October of last year, we had a fundraising event uh, at, a, at a Cuban restaurant in order to collect money to prepare these paintings for exhibition. <coughs> in Cuba, of course, the people there wanted their heroes to come back home, so they had lots of banners and murals and wall paintings. And finally, they did. So on December 17, 2014, they were back home. And what's really remarkable is that the five of them went straight to the offices of President uh, Raul Castro and said, uh, Mr. President, sir, we're glad to be home. What's our next assignment? So they were ready to come back and defend their country again, even after 16 years in prison. And there they are again. So we're happy that they're back home. And we're also happy that now the United States and Cuban government will talk to each other uh, and not uh, in a two-way, not just United States to Cuba. They will actually have a dialogue. But we still need to pressure this government 
to end the embargo against Cuba and let them let their economy survive. And also, we have books here. And I want to mention my friend, uh, Mary Martin, over here. Mary also has, if you're interested in books from the art show, which has the paintings, you come see her afterwards. Uh, and we're asking for a donation. She'll explain that to you for those books. Otherwise, we have wonderful books in our library. We really want everyone to study the history of U.S.-Cuba relations all those uh, uh, laws that were passed in the United States, and to study the history of the Cuban Revolution. And uh, maybe you recognize the man with Fidel Castro? Malcolm X, yes, Malcolm X. Uh, Malcolm X was uh, a friend of the Cuban people, a friend of the Cuban Revolution, and uh, he was not afraid to say so in, uh, in the early years. So he was a great friend of the Cuban people. So thank you very much for listening, and then let's have a little some questions and discussions. Okay. Yes. Well, now that the the period of more or less direct military threat on Cuba is ending or lessening. Uh, do you think the Cubans are well prepared to withstand a more psychological kind of John Perkins economic hitman pressure uh, that would probably be brought on them? So, the, so if, if I can rephrase it, so there's a there's a poss not yet, but it's the possibility that tra the travel to Cuba will be easier because right now for American people with American passport to go to Cuba, it's difficult. You just you need permission. But it's possible that in the future more and more Americans will go. And what will happen to the Cuban people, their, uh, their solidarity, their, their unity in, in, uh, with, the, with the revolution? And I'm con I personally am confident that the, that the Cuban people will be happy to engage with American uh, visitors. And of course, there will be some visitors who will go for the wrong reasons. We know that. But, Please, if you can, please stay for the next hour because we want to hear a presentation about people who are going to Cuba for the right reasons, which is to learn and share with the people of Cuba as they try to rebuild their neighborhoods, their schools, their clinics, and to keep what they've made out of their revolution, even in, in these really bad economic times. So there are plenty of organizations and people who want to go and make a positive contribution to Cuba. But I'm confident that overall the Cuban people will defend their revolutionary spirit. Yes? Um, so when the, um, when the revolution happened, did all of the American business interests, they, they don't own that, what they own anymore, right? There's no ownership there of the businesses? Correct. The, uh, at the time of the nationalization, what happened to the ownership? The, uh, the Cuban government actually offered to buy these properties at their declared tax rates, which did not make the owners happy because everyone knows that owners like to really suppress their, their, evalu their evaluation for taxes. But the Cuban government also offered to buy a lot of these businesses with bonds, Cuban bonds, 20-year uh, bonds paying 4%, very generous. But for the, for the American owners, it wasn't a question of, um, of getting paid fully or compensated for losing their lands. They really didn't like losing control. That was the, rig that was, that was the, 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 the step that the Cuban people take that the American owners and banks could not tolerate, is that the Cuban people took control. That was, and that was for the American bankers and politicians and government. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. I think it was um, well concisely put, and it wasn't didn't feel like too much information, and a lot of new information for me. So thank you. Well, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Well, a lot, of, like I said, uh, a lot of American people now. Every 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 day we hear something new about Cuba now because the United States government is having formal conversations with uh, Cuban officials. 
or there's, there's, they'll be, they're discussing immigration and other kinds of issues. So we'll hear more about that. Yes. Um, how do students rate their system of education? Um, having just been to Cuba, and almost everybody I met over the age of 20 has like a master's or a PhD. They are, they, I would say that most people are, it's, it's completely free, all the way to a doctor. Um, and um, very highly regarded. Ed education and medicine are considered to be, like, they have some of the best healthcare system in, in the Western Hemisphere. It's like Cuba is one of the best places to have a baby. In, in the world. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I heard that too. I think, that too. Yeah. I think a lot of people around the world heard that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There's an excellent video that this library has copies of mm -hmm. uh, called Salud! <coughs> exclamation. There are probably some other saludes in the database, but Salud! Exclamation. And it's about the, their medical system and how they're sharing it, sharing their talents with the world. Yes, yes. When um, the Ebola crisis started to develop in Western <coughs> Africa, uh, Cuba was one of the first governments to respond in a big way. And the government asked for volunteers to come and help fight Ebola. And when the government put out a, a, a notice, please volunteer, 16,000, 16,000 people, medical workers, said, I want to go. I want to go. And, and the government was able to send about two to three hundred. Not everybody could go. It was a big response. I just want to add one more thing to that question you asked, Ian, because I was talking more about it, I guess, in terms of higher level degrees and whatnot. But I remember one of the first days we were in, in Cuba, we were in Havana, and everywhere we went, people would say to us, today is a very important day for Cuba. And we had to kind of a joke after all, because we all knew what they were going to say next, which is, it's the first day of school. And it was like this, um, our tour guide was going to, was with us all the, the whole time, was not there with us at first day because she has an eight-year-old son and she really wanted to be there in the school. And um, before we got on our, our big tour and went to many different government agencies, we were one, a group of us were wandering around a neighborhood of Havana and saw a school where there were these parents and there was a, a dance and, and a performance by the children. And it felt very much like it was every, every, you know, every, it was like the center of the neighborhood and everybody was there to support these kids. So um, a, a very strong sense of education is highly valued by families and, and even by the kids. So. Yes? Uh, I'm one of the volunteers that went to Havana exhibit that John referred to that's at the Columbia City Gallery right now. And I wanted to explain that this is the only place in North America where this exhibit is currently being shown. It's gone all over the world. And I think it's in New Zealand also right now. Um, it's free and it's open to the public. And it's up at the gallery until February 22nd. And the gallery is closed on Mondays and Tuesdays. That's all on the card. But if anyone is interested in having this exhibit at your school, at your church, at your union hall, or any other place where you think people would like to have the paintings brought and explanation given, uh, that's possible. Let me know. Yeah, some, some of us are very happy to take the, take the show and information to other people and explain this, this story. Any? Yes. Yeah, so have you been to Cuba? Oh, yes. Well, I was there 20 years ago. And uh, I was there with a delegation of, of unionists. And it's actually very interesting now that I think about it because the Cuban Five came to the United States in the early 90s to do their mission and to watch these kind of revolutionary groups. So they've been away from Cuba that long, 20 years almost. They're home now, and of course, they've been away 20 years, they can see big changes. One of the big changes is that life is very difficult, and a lot of people, unfortunately, are getting very tired of the <coughs> difficult life. So a lot of the revolutionary spirit is a little bit weak, and this is what they've seen. So they are. that's why they're so happy now to come be home and be able to find a way to contribute in order to maintain uh, the attitudes people have. But the economic embargo does, does, it does damage to the Cuban economy and Cuba, 
human society. So it, we really want people to think about uh, telling this story, uh, learning about it, and finding ways to uh, challenge the economic embargo. Oh, yes. oh, so um, one of your slides from much earlier about, is it, is it Gross, Grossman? The, the Alan Gross? Gross. Um, what kind of electronics is he taking that were not allowed? Yes, uh, Alan Gross was uh, an USAID contractor. His electronics were were allowed internet users to bypass the Cuban networks and connect directly with other uh, uh, other other satellites. Right. So those those were only used at universities or government installations. So at this time, they they are not allowed. But he was bringing those in. So the Cuban government censors what people can get over the internet? Uh, internet access is, uh, actually internet access is very limited because Cuban access to the satellites is also limited because of the economic embargo. Uh, a lot of the satellites are United States property or companies. So in order for Cuba telecommunications to contract and get that wide band access is very difficult. So computer access, internet access is just limited. And of course that's a form of restriction, so people don't have a chance. A few, uh, about a year ago, there was uh, an attempt by USAID to set up a uh, social network, Zoom Zunio, within Cuba. And they went in and they just started saying, we're just entrepreneurs, we want to set up this social network on the internet so young people can talk and share music. Well, it actually it turned out to be a, a, a project of USAID where they wanted to subscribe thousands of young people and then start sending out uh, this, uh, this information about Cuba uh, using this network. So it was exposed, New York Times had an article and the USAID had to back off and say, uh, Yes, they, they were they were trying to violate human human laws. Oh wait, wait anyone else? Yes, yes. What are the main exports uh, of Cuba, and where are they going right now? Oh, uh, uh, historically nickel ore. Cuba is the main supplier of nickel ore, and of course uh, sugar. Uh, but. Nickel or sugar, and uh, yeah, their cigars, their cigars are famous, and of course the rum are famous. But the other export we don't hear about are the biotechnological developments. The, there are very, very uh, impressive biotechnological centers in Cuba for development of vaccines and different medications. And a lot of those are unavailable in the United States because of the embargo. What about oil? Any oil or anything like that? No oil, oil when, uh, when, when, the, you know, when the U.S. companies left Cuba in 1960, uh, they took their drilling maps with them. So offshore, there probably are oil <coughs> reserves, uh, but they won't share that information. But Canadian and Spanish companies are contracting with Cuba to explore offshore. They found some, but uh, they think there's more out there. But right now, Cuba is receiving a lot of oil from Venezuela, which has helped a lot. But unfortunately, with the drop, with the fall in oil prices, it, it's difficult for Venezuela to maintain that um, contribution to the Cuban people. So it's difficult. Oh, yes, sir. Well, thank you uh, very much for your presentation. Uh, Cuba is a very important subject because uh, their revolution uh, is the first revolution in the Americas for a free territory where the workers and farmers are the masters of their country as opposed to the big capitalist class here in the United States. And so that's something that, that sticks like a, in, the, in the throat of the United States. They can't stand that revolution to be an example of freedom for other exploited and oppressed countries around the world. And that's why the United States had the trade embargo for so long, and why it's still not being, it's still not been lifted. 
And that's why the United States has shifted tactics here a little bit. They're, they're, they're taking a new tack of trying to um, bring in more money, more U.S. money into the country, and to try to open up the, the economy. They hope to weaken the revolution. Of course, the Cubans need to have trade and, and so forth, so they, 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 they also uh, need to have trade to receive the type of commodities and goods they need to sustain their revolution. But this, uh, uh, the, the viewpoint of the U.S. imperialists here is to try to weaken the revolution to overthrow it. That's why they've taken this new tack, the, the old tack of, uh, of not allowing uh, any collaboration by the, the Cubans around the world has fallen on a lot of deaf ears. A lot of countries in Latin America in particular are hostile to this trade embargo, even though they're small capitalist countries in Latin America. So that, that's some of the political dynamics still at play here. And uh, that's why it's so important to talk about the, the Cuban Five, to fight for the trade embargo to be lifted. And through that, then, we can strengthen, we can help support the Cuban Revolution, which is something well worth looking at in more detail because it has so many important things to offer for the future of the crisis that we're all in. The capitalist system is in deep crisis worldwide right now. We cannot, we're in a so-called jobless recovery. That is, the wealthy keep getting wealthier, but for the working people here in the United States and other capitalist countries, we're getting ground further into the ground. And so, uh, it's very important to have a discussion here about this. I'm very happy to be yeah. here today. One more question? Oh, Kimberly, what was Kimberly? What was the fun? Right here. Let's try. Let's try. What do you think are the main causes, if you can uh, list any specifics for the embargo? Are there any maybe interests with uh, or against American companies, maybe American tobacco companies or sugar companies or anything like that? that could play some kind of a crucial role? Oh, no, I, I don't think they targeted specific <coughs> companies. Mm -hmm. I think uh, just the major companies that uh, that were most likely influencing American policy. Uh, United Fruit Company influences United States government policy quite a bit. And, uh, and uh, of course, in 1954, when the people of Guatemala tried to uh, implement a very small land reform, the Guatemalan army was organized by the CIA and the United States military to overthrow that president and to protect the lands of the United Fruit in Guatemala. So the people <coughs> knew this history. They knew it would be very dangerous, very, uh, but they were, they were united and organized, and they were able to do, make these changes and uh, protect the changes. Okay, I was just going to add something to that. I, you know, I think you have to realize that was during the Cold War, uh, the height of the Cold War, and the fear of communism and socialism in the United States was intense. And so this idea of strangling almost uh, um, uh, um, creating that sense of desperation amongst the Cuban people that they were hoping that the, the, the revolution would have collapsed under the economic, that the people would be so hungry and dispirited that it, they would have to, like, you know, turn to the U.S. Yeah. Like but they never did. Is anybody here from China? From China? Yeah, so Cuba was the first country in, uh, in America to recognize the People's Republic of China. And also, Cuba was also the country that said in the United Nations, the People's Republic of China should be the country sitting in the Security Council, not Taiwan. So the people, the government of Cuba knew that it also in the world was going to make some important contributions. So, oh, I just wanted to thank everyone. Let's thank John. He did a wonderful job. Um, with Phoebe Jewell and Marjorie Richards, and they'll be discussing Cuba Libre, Gender and Sexuality in Cuba. So if you're able, please stay. Please stay. Um, if not, thank you for coming. We hope to see you again. And please give me your surveys as you walk out. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
I am. Because, uh,